for me personally, I, as I look over the stuff that you've done, you know, I grew up during the, the 90s, um, during a time when, you know, I read comic books and I would dream about what those comic books would look like when they finally were in a movie or when they were put into a TV show. And at the time that uh, the CGI just wasn't there to make it, to make it quality. They had tried a couple times in the past and they just hadn't been very good. But I remember the dream that someday I'd be able to see my favorite characters um, on TV. Uh, certainly we had seen that before with uh, a couple of those shows, but for me, uh, uh, Arrow was one of those was one of those programs that I think first really got my attention. Can you kind of explain a little bit about how you went about creating Arrow and if you had realized that it would kind of create this this universe that we've been enjoying? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I tell you, I, I can't talk about Arrow without first talking about Green Lantern because so much of the Green Lantern experience informs the informs Arrow. Uh, I'll get and I'll give you a little little backstory. So Greg and I, Greg Berlanti and I, were working on Eli Stone, and even though it's funny, we hadn't even started filming the pilot yet, we we felt like the network was not behind us. It, it felt like we were swimming upstream. It felt like they didn't quite respect or appreciate the project, and we were in New York uh, and we were uh, casting for Eli for the pilot and we were flying back. And on the flight back, Greg said to me like, I have an idea for a, t a movie take uh, based on Green Lantern. And, and we, we just spent the whole flight back talking about it. And we, you know, then uh, Michael Green, who, who both of us had worked on, uh, worked with on uh, Jack and Bobby uh, and, and Greg worked with on Everwood, uh, you know, came into the fold and the three of us spent, you know, like six months to a year writing uh, a draft of Green Lantern. Um, and then, you know, Greg was attached to direct and we were, you know, we did several drafts and then, you know, they, they basically, I think what happened was Warner Brothers realized, wait a minute, um, are we really going to let uh, three TV writers um, do a $250 million movie? <laughs> Right. Um, and that's when Greg was replaced by Martin Campbell and Michael Goldenberg was brought to run in to rewrite the script. And, you know, long story short, uh, the project kind of got taken away from us, you know, and, and the, the movie that you saw is, is the, you know, what resulted. And the lesson there was, first of all, you know, not that we needed to be taught this particular lesson, but adapting the Silver Age characters for the 21st century is really hard. Um, you know, Marvel has a little bit easier. Their characters are from the 1960s. There's not a domino mask in sight. Um, you know, they don't have a character who makes big green fists and whose weakness is yellow, you know. And that's to take nothing away from what Kevin Feige, who's an absolute modern genius, uh, has right. done in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But um, it's just the degree of difficulty is a little, you know, is a little uh, higher. At any rate, um, recognizing that degree of difficulty, uh, we went into Arrow with a lot of trepidation. Um, there was, a, you know, a good period of time where we didn't even want to do it because we were just afraid that history was going to repeat itself, that we would, you know, do this work and then eventually it would get taken away from us. Now in television, it works a little differently than features, but we were fundamentally afraid of the notes process. You know, we were afraid of the project becoming something different, much the same way Green Lantern had, just by simply being noted to death. So the, our, our first goal really was, we said, look, we, we can't develop this the traditional way, in the traditional network way, which is typically you pitch to the studio, then you pitch to the network, then you, then you write a story area, then you write an outline, then you write a script, then you write, rewrite the script 20 million times, get notes, all in the hopes of getting a green light for your pilot. And it's, it's a process that, that just, you know, has a lot of notes and, and in a lot of cases can take you away from what the essence of, of what the project wants to be. And what, what Greg and I said is we're not going to do it that way. Uh, we will pitch to the studio, we'll pitch to the network, and then if you guys like what we pitched you, you'll get a script. There won't be a story area. There won't be, you know, an article in Variety. Um, there won't be an outline. It will just be us in a room working on a draft that no one knows we're working on. And then we will give it to you and you will decide whether or not you want to make the pilot. 
Um, and, you know, and that's, by the way, that's, you know, not to take anything away from the executives we were working with, who are all very fine people and really are friends of the show and everything, but we really felt like the way to pull this off uh, required us to have a, a lot more autonomy than, than this. Tip. And then, you know, we, we turned in our first draft and David Nutter, uh, who directed the pilot, uh, and David Nutter just, you, you can IMDb him, but basically he's the Steven Spielberg of pilots. Um, okay. Uh, you know, uh, he's, he's the best pilot director in the history of television. He, you know, his record for getting pilots picked up, you know, he did Smallville, he did Supernatural, um, you know, he's, he directed the Red Wedding episode of, the, of Game of Thrones. Um, oh, wow. You know, I always said, like, I, I've never met anyone so suited to their job as David is to directing pilots. It's like he was grown in the lab for that purpose. And, you know, he was a big part of the reason the pilot, you know, was what it was. And, and you know, it was just a, a process of, uh, of us, you know, just having a vision and always sticking to it uh, and always fighting for it um, and putting every decision, the big ones and the small ones through the lens of that vision. Uh, at the same time, like to answer your, the second part of your question, you know, did we think it was going to spawn anything? From my perspective, the answer is no. Um, you know, from my perspective, the exercise was how do we not embarrass ourselves? You know, how, how do we avoid a repeat of the Green Lantern experience? Uh, that being said, I think halfway through Arrow uh, season one, Greg started to feel like, well, maybe we can do a Flash spinoff. But I think even then, I don't think he was envisioning, you know, what we ultimately ended up doing. I mean, I remember when we did Crisis on Earth X and we had the big scene on the bridge of the Wave Rider with all the characters, I, I sent a picture of it to Greg and going like, did you ever think this was ever going to happen? You know? Um, I, I don't think any of us had, you know, uh, a, a, the ambition to, or the foresight to go, you're going to have this many characters, you know, all in one place at one particular time. I mean, it, it, it continues to blow me away that we did that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, it just amazes me how, um, that it all started with the era with Arrow. And from that, you know, we get the introduction of White Canary, of the Atom, of Legends, I mean, to me, it's just amazing how influential that one show has been um, to the entire fandom. That's pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Uh, um, thank you for saying that. I have to say, I hadn't really thought of it that way. Uh, and I, I like that. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a fair point. But it just goes to show you how, how little introspection I, I do in general, uh, much less with respect to the shows.